You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello and welcome to episode 368 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined by the usual crew, Seth Miller, Fosma Mood, gentlemen. Good afternoon. What's going yeah. on? We're recording this earlier than usual, so I have a cup of coffee today, not any kind of alcoholic beverage, because that would be bad at 10 a.m. Why? <laughs> This would be the weekend to do it. Of all, this weekends. is true. This is true. This yeah. is our usual uh, scamper would, around the world. Yeah, this would. This episode would typically be recorded in a freezing cold town in Europe somewhere. Uh, yes, in person. Unfortunately, we were not able to do that this year with with copious amount, copious amounts of beers that we find at a local grocery store. That's true. We do usually do it beer tasting as well. Exactly. Uh, so we've got some follow up from last week. I think uh, we had one comment on Twitter. Uh, I think this was Fabian. Uh, yeah, he's a pilot friend of ours. Uh, and he was, he was talking about the radio altimeters that, uh, were mentioned during the last show by Jason. Uh, and those are actually active, but, uh, above 20, 2,500 feet, they don't display to the pilots. Yeah. And so. that's all related to the sort of 5G radio yep. thing, which we should note since we last recorded, the FAA has issued more than 1,500 no dams, uh, which is the beginnings of the you can't use radio altimeters because 5G is active around here uh, process that was in place. So um, come the 19th, things are going to get interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's in four days. Do you think we're going to see delay, a lot of delays because they're having to reroute traffic around this stuff? Or, I mean, potentially, maybe? Well, what I'm not entirely sure of is there was sort of like that they came up with the, like the two-week delay and then the agreement to change the power settings and all that other stuff. So I'm not... I'm not 100% sure what's actually going to take effect. Mm. I think these the notums were issued so that if they have to, they can they can act they can quickly activate the no you have to, you know, you can't use these uh additional systems, yeah. the radio altimeter and the other associated, you know, high hyper uh high precision guidance systems. Yep. So I think that's a starting point, but what actually happens is going to be very interesting. But yes, if if they start to say that pilots can't use that stuff, we, we face the situation of anything low vis, mm-hmm. like planes can't land. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have to wait till it clears up or go a different direction or divert. Yeah. Them. yeah. And I'm, I'm super excited that Boston's not excluded, not included in the uh, waivers anyways, so, and the power waivers on the 5G side, so. Yeah. Are you traveling soon? Uh, I'll be flying home on the 19th or on the 20th. Oh, okay. So you're going to learn firsthand. No, I'll be flying on the 19th. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Interesting. And you'll be going into Ontario, right? Ontario, California. I'm doing Ontario, DFW, Boston on the 19th if things hold. So yeah, yeah, That'll be interesting. Um, I wanted to follow up on the Cessna plane crash in Los Angeles. Foz, have you seen this? I have not. Okay, you, you got to watch the video. you got to find it right now. Watch it while Seth and I are talking. So and this is you, the one that Jason mentioned, like, he got distracted middle of last episode, like, while recording. It's like, someone just sent me a video of a plane getting hit by a train in Los Angeles, and that's what this is. Yes. You need, you need to look it up, Foz, and then give us your unedited opinion of this. Because I, when Jason mentioned it, I looked it up, and it was like, oh, it's a plane getting hit by, hit by a train. And it looked like everybody was, it was safe. Like, everyone was safe. It, that's not yes. the case. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everyone was safe. Everyone was safe. It was a lot closer than it looked. On yes. <laughs> the video. That does not look like fun. No. That would definitely not buff right out. <laughs> yeah. The Sandy landing you can walk away from is a good one. And, in and this, this guy, in this this case, guy barely walked away. Yeah, and in this case, they will not be reusing the plane. Yes. I mean, I mean they're pulling him out, I'd say, 10 seconds, 15 seconds before not the train comes. Um, they got like they got to it then, but like you can see, they're like trying to help him, trying to help him, and then when the body cam footage ends, they're literally just dragging him because he can't move, and they realize they got to get away. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wild. I mean, when when Jason first posted it or said you know this happened, I didn't seem that close, but it was very close and could yeah. have ended very badly. So very good news. So um, unlike the other train challenges in Los Angeles, <laughs> the cargo trains. Yeah, what is going on with that? I mean, totally not related to anything we theoretically cover in the show, but uh, Union Pacific's having trains robbed in the depot in L.A., and, like, people are just pillaging. Are we back in the 1800s? What's going on? It's a wild, wild west all over again. Yeah. Well, in the 1800s, Union Pacific cops would show up and shoot you. Yeah, this is true. They're not even doing that. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's crazy. Like, there, there's some video out of, like, someone sort of scanning a a rail yard and it's just like detritus everywhere empty amazon boxes and crap all over the sides of the uh the siding all over the that is nuts side of the railroads so yeah, yeah not, not I saw it wasn't even empty empty boxes it was sealed packages yeah well i mean the empty is after people have grabbed them and gone through them 
Yeah. But so are they just like pulling them off the trains and then yeah. like leaving them there and then coming back and going through what's on the ground? No, I, think, I think they're just hanging out on the like hanging out at the side of the train doing the things that they want to do, like you know looking for good stuff and then leaving everything else behind and walking away with their haul. Yeah, wild. Oh man. Um, let's let's talk about the TWA hotel. This this was a tw- a Twitter post that someone posted. And I, I kind of got mixed feedback. So the original post stated, "There's nothing special about the hotel." I had asked for an ironing board. I don't, I don't get the hype. And from that comment, uh, yes, if you need an ironing board, it is a terrible hotel. Like, okay, but is it overrated as a as a general hotel in your opinion? Yes, yes. Okay, I think I can agree with that. Right. I think as an av geek hotel, it still holds some uh, je ne sais quoi. Uh, for for people who like aviation related stuff, but it's not amazing. It's, it's okay. A ni- it's a nice hotel. The thing it really has going for it is location. And I tried to bring that up, and people are like, "Well, you know, it's just one terminal." Yeah, but you can get to the air train too. So, well, but you have to remember, right, people who have flown through JFK are jaded because they they've never had a air- hotel close to the airport. <laughs> so th- this is like this is the best they're gonna ever get. So they have to hold on to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be nice if there was another hotel. I, I'm with you, Steve, and yes, it's right on, well, not right on the air train. You gotta like go in through the terminal and up and yeah. around, and it takes like 20 minutes to get to the air train. Um, in a mile walk. But yes, it's right on the air train, and you can get to any of the other terminals. I think the real challenge to me, and this comes partly from having lived in New York for so long, is if I have to be at the airport overnight, or at the airport, and if I, like, I have to stay at a hotel in the New York City area anyways. Yeah. Is it worth staying at JFK? Yeah. And so, like, JetBlue uses it as a crew hotel. Mm-hmm. I get that, right? And that's actually, I think, who needed the ironing board was a crew member. So someone who had to, like, iron their shirt as a pilot or something like that. So, like, needs the uniform ironed, fine. I, I get that. And if you know going in that they don't have them at the room, when you're checking and you can ask for one, whatever. But at the same time, like, the number of times people are like, oh, you know, oh, I have a layover. It's 10 hours at JFK or whatever. Where should I stay? Usually the answer was just going to either, mm-hmm. you know, a decent, you know, like, Long Island City or going to Manhattan. And at least then, like, you can get some food. You can do any, like, the food options at the hotel are not good. Subpar. Yeah. And that's being polite. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I am, but sure, we'll do that this week. They're not good. Uh, they're, 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 it's they're, not. Yeah. And so, like, at that point, okay, the Connie bar is kind of cute, but the bar in the constellation, but like, also, it's an Abdi cachet thing, not a, this is useful. Yeah. Sort of thing. And so that, that's where I struggle with it. I have had a couple trips where I've been like, you know what? I'm finally going to stay there and I'll spend. It's also stupid expensive. That was the other thing I was going to say. Is it, I mean, I think it averages like $200 a night or more usually, um, which is high. Yeah. I mean, like, right. So that's where I'm, I get like, you, I can stay in Long Island City and have a round trip car mm-hmm. and probably pay less. And admittedly, there's, you know, the risk of getting stuck on the Van Wick and having to fight traffic and dealing with the LIE and all that crap. So there is a time factor that goes into it. But... It's just, I can also have food and like, or, I don't know. Well, I mean, to give you an example, I mean, my wife and I, when we flew Swiss first for the first time, we flew into JFK, mm-hmm. but we were connecting out of Newark and it was an overnight. That was the only way I could get it to actually work sure. because <clears throat> they didn't, there was no way to get from JFK to where we needed to go. Okay. Um, and so we, we spent the night in Manhattan and it was, you know, it's a 30 minute cab ride or whatever. At least, and, yeah. At least. And it was it was pretty quiet when we came back in. And so we got dinner in the city and then had a great night's rest and then flew out the next, I guess, afternoon almost because we just kind of said, we'll just take it easy and kind mm-hmm. of use New York as our adjustment, you know, from jet lag. And it was great. Uh, I think, you know, I've spent the night at the TWA hotel and it's it's nice as a av geek haven. Is it worth it? Only if only if I'm flying JetBlue, really, or maybe United at a JFK. Or maybe BA, if I like, came in late at night, needed somewhere to stay, and I was taking a daytime flight on BA or something. I, I, I mean, don't know. If the weather's nice, you can walk to most of the terminals from there. That's true. The parking lot. Although they don't want you to, but yes, you can. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the other thing I would put out there is part of the Avgeek appeal is the rooftop pool deck and plane spotting. Yeah. And for semi-justified reasons, the hotel has had to cut back on, or has chosen to cut back on how that's treated. Yeah. Uh, so... Non guests, the I think it's like a it was at least like a fifty dollar cover charge to get in, yeah, plus bar tab and whatever. Um, and it was like for a two hour window, yeah, no bags on the pool deck. There was there was a lot of interesting limitations in that regard. Um, but now even guests though, even guests were starting to get charged at one point, which is absurd still to me. Are they yeah. still? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's absurd to me. 
I, I, I would have been okay if they had said like it's a two drink minimum or something at the pool deck. Like that, okay, as a guest, fine, whatever. Right. But charging me 25, 30 bucks to go to the pool for an hour and a half, that's ridiculous on top of a $200 room. So, I mean, I think, I think they've kind of, and, and, and two, the hotel isn't really been taken care of very well. Um, it, it, I think when Steve and I stayed there, I, I think I talked about it on the show, it was pretty beat up. Uh, my room was missing some tiles and stuff, but it, it still had the, the cachet for me. I mean, I had a window overlooking the Emirates A380. Out my, I mean, that's kind of awesome. And the Singapore A350. So that was really cool. Um, but, but, you, but you make a good point, right? The hotels look dated now because yeah. they don't maintain it. They don't, no. And that's a large part of the problem, right? And, and the other aspect of it is the owner is the big proponent of debundling all everything, right? Hmm. From a cost perspective, making everything a separate chargeable item, which in the end is going to cost more to the end user. Yeah. And, and I don't think people really realize that. Uh, and, and when you think about the $210, $250 room or whatever, it starts to add up. If, you know, Wi-Fi is not included. I mean, I think Wi-Fi is included, but I could see them changing that soon. And, you know, anyway. uh, that, that won't change, I bet, but other things might. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's $210 plus 18% New York City occupancy tax. Yeah. So it adds up quick. So I don't know. I mean, if you're connecting through JFK and you want somewhere cool to stay and, and really, really, really don't want to leave the property. Yeah. Like if, the airport. Yeah. And, and that's the other thing is like taking the air train. I think someone complained about the air train to the, the subway with the $5 fee or whatever. <clears throat> Seven bucks now, isn't it? Is it, is it five on top of the 250 or is it? Seven dollars on top of the two fifty now. I thought was, I thought they raised the rate. Okay, maybe they did. So it's seven dollars on top of the two fifty. Still nine dollars, nine fifty, ten bucks even to take a forty minute subway ride. Eh, I don't know. Like compare that to Munich, where it's nearly forty bucks, or you know Singapore, or <laughs> Munich's not that expensive to get to the airport, is it? It's like thirty, I think. Now I need a I need to look. That's because you, it's a regular Deutsche Bahn ticket. It's not. <clears throat> I would argue these days the Munich experience would be a much nicer experience than the subway. <laughs> The experience on the on the uh, trains in New York is not great right now. No, I mean, I've heard of people seeing watching people take a dump in the subway car. Oh, okay. I've heard. I've well, we seen, are back to the 1980s. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard people getting hassled for no good reason, fights breaking out. Crazy. Let's see here. I want to. I think this. it's only 12 euro. 12 euro. Okay, so 15 bucks, and which is sort of akin to San Francisco, but much yeah. more than say DC or Boston. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, I don't think. Like that price on the air train doesn't bother me as much, especially compared to like a cab ride, which can be fifty bucks. I think right is the flat rate from JFK to Manhattan. Oh, it's more than that. Is it? Oh, it's fifty-five, and then plus tip and toll. Manhattan. Let's see. Taxi fifty-two plus tolls and tip. Okay. Yeah. So probably by the time you're done with it, it's sixty bucks, seventy bucks. Yeah, plus four fifty if you're in a uh, peak time. Yeah. So and and if unless you insist, they are not going to take uh, what is it the Queensboro. 59th Street. 59th Street Bridge, yeah. They won't do it. So they refuse for whatever reason because they want the toll. <laughs> well, they, they get to charge you. Actually, they they, no, they can no longer charge the full price and only pay the discounted rate. Oh, really? So that used to be part of the scam is that you, you – it's sort of like the rental car thing, like, right? If you get the toll pass in a rental car, mm-hmm. they charge you rack rate, the published cash pay rate, but they only get charged the discounted easy pass rate. Uh, I got you. So and they're so, skimming. They, they, yeah, they're marking up basically. Yeah. But I th- I, so they can't. I don't think they're allowed to overcharge. The taxis aren't allowed to overcharge you. Town cars will, like a black car service. Yeah, I think still can. I'm not sure where Uber slash Lyft <laughs> falls in that mix, but I would assume under the black car service. I had a fight with my drive with my uh, back when I lived there. I had a bit of a fight with the company that I used as a car service because they were doing that, and I was like, why? And that, but I think the reality is the drivers like it because whatever number typically tip gets at calculated on the total number. Yeah. So tip is going to go higher as a result as well. And that's what I thought with, with cabs or the way it used to be with cabs, yeah. right? Is that a higher number. They're like, oh, they'll leave me a bigger tip. I always right. leave, you know, a standard five bucks or whatever from the airport. So, yeah. Because I'm a terrible person. Yes. You can at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Hong Kong. Uh, they is there have, anything left to talk about? Uh, <laughs> not, soon there won't be. Um, they basically banned transit passengers from around 150 countries. Uh, citing coronavirus and trying to contain it and not wanting people from these 150 countries that are considered high risk transiting through the airport. Um, this essentially kills Cathay, right? Right. Beyond essentially, but yes. But, I mean, this is, this is, this is all, I mean, I mean, that's all that's going through Hong Kong right now. Like no one's going to Hong Kong. So, uh, what, what is the, what is the point? Um, yeah. I- I have no idea. Is the short is my, would be my short response to that. Um, I, I guess 
the thing I was like, before I answer that, there's also more in that like Cathay is being investigated by the government for uh, employees breaching quarantine rules because apparently they have to like, even if the remote country where they're laying over doesn't require it, they're supposed, they're expected to like self quarantine, I think. At the remote country? At the, at the destination. Like th- there's a whole lot of regulations about how they're supposed to behave. And part of that is, you know, like pilots brought back COVID the other day and, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the government's unhappy about that. But, um, there, it's the cuts that China is implementing are, insane in many ways and there are like just it's killing uh cafe in hong kong but like they also are implementing strict cuts against uh there's strict rules about if you arrive in mainland china and have more than I don't know, three or five cases that test positive on arrival that that airline and city pair cannot be served for two weeks <laughs> hard stop they just say okay nope and so like united got blocked from operating its san francisco seoul shanghai route because seven people tested positive on on arrival a little while ago and like in any given day there's a one guy a a couple folks on twitter who sort of publish the list when it gets updated every day or so and it's like two or three a day now are getting blocked it seems so so will there be any flights out of china soon (laughs) um well, that's a fair question, but with everything getting blocked again, right, you may recall the U.S. sort of cut back on the U.S. limited what China was allowed to operate into the U.S. because China was limiting what the U.S. was allowed to operate into China. And now with additional limits coming, those cuts are being uh, more strictly enforced. And it's somewhat ironic, like coming into the Olympics, which are still happening somehow in China, uh, like no one's going to be there. Yeah. I don't even understand how they're still happening. Like they're going to, they want to have COVID zero apparently still in China and they're going to have the, I mean, it just, it's kind of, I guess there's so much money tied up in it that they feel like they have to, they have to do it. But But, I mean, the money is sponsorships, but also a lot of that money usually is from tourism. So I don't know, or associated with the sponsorships. So it's hard for me to figure out how, and I understand that China's version of accounting is different than the United States's, but um, it's, it's bizarre to me. Yeah, it's it's really weird. I I don't think Cathay survives COVID. Um, uh, unfortunately, I like them as a carrier. I think you know someone else will fill in the gaps there. One of the Chinese carriers, more than likely. China Southern, probably right across the border in Guangzhou. Yeah, and you know they'll bring some planes over, maybe keep some staff, and that'll be that. I mean, do, what, do you need to keep Hong Kong as a gateway and tra- and connection point in transit place or just move all that to Guangzhou. That's good. Is the train from Guangzhou is it high speed? Yes. So theoretically you could just fly everything into Guangzhou and take a high speed train to Hong Kong if you wanted? Yeah, it was like 45 minutes I think. Yeah. I mean, there's that. I I think for O and D maybe you keep Hong Kong. It makes some sense. Right? Well, uh, it makes so one of the challenges with the train is uh, immigration. Yep. Right. And that was a big deal when they put the station in Hong Kong West, uh, when they brought the railroad to terminate there, the like bottom floor is considered mainland China. Yep. We saw it when we were there. Yeah. I mean, I, I did it when I, we were there. Yeah. That's how I got to Hong Kong when we went three or four years ago now. Um, but I just, I feel like there's, if, if you keep that immigration point, you can't really have, uh, Guangzhou as the alternate airport that really works. Yeah. But there's no guarantee China really keeps it is a separate special autonomous region at this point. And the way they've, the way the policies have been shifting with seemingly accelerating pace over the last three or four years, even before COVID came around. Yep. I would argue there's a very real risk that like there's going to be a snap vote and Hong Kong is going to vote to just assimilate into mainland China and be done with it. Yeah. And at that point, I mean, couldn't you use Shenzhen as well? Or maybe that's what I'm thinking about of Shenzhen, not Guangzhou. Yeah. Guangzhou. I mean, Guangzhou is a little bit further up. Shenzhen's right there, right? Like it's, Really yeah, close. I mean, could it move to Macau? <laughs> you could. Uh, it's airport a smaller airport. Not though. really, though. Yeah, it's only one runway, right? At yeah, Macau? I think so. And could right could they just could they just annex Hong Kong Airport to Macau? No, they could. It's with the artificial islands and the new tunnel and everything, the new bridge and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and the ferries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're because, still building that third runway. They just took another four billion dollar loan, I think. So, well, and it has its border crossing facilities there too, right? Like yeah. that whole new island that they built for border crossings. At the airport? I mean, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> good good call, Foz. Good call. I try. I mean, it's tragic that, you know, this is what's happening in Hong Kong because it was a great city and a great uh, – Cathay was a great airline. But at the end of the day, right, if the if this is the political climate and the finance customers are leaving, there's no reason for the, the uh, 
prestigious of an airline to be there. That was what was propping them up. Yeah. And you're now banned from China. So just so you know, <laughs> for speaking badly. I didn't say anything. I just said the industry's gone. <laughs> we have no, get, we have no negativity and in, in, everything is still in, in Hong Kong. Yes. Everything is fine. And now I'm banned. Um, we need Officer Bob Brady. Nothing to see here. People move along. Yes, exactly. Uh, Finnair has cut 20% of their ops, uh, and Virgin Australia has cut 25%, and Delta Regionals has cut by 25%. This is all COVID, right? Omicron-ish related, yeah, in theory. Well, let me rephrase. Uh, Finnair and Virgin Australia both cited Omicron and COVID as the reason. Uh, Delta is the latest to acknowledge that its regional capacity is being trimmed, uh, essentially due to staffing shortages that are being translated to pilot shortages at the regional carriers in the U.S. Wow. So, um, with, um, with, with Finnair, has it been mostly long haul or is it, they cut? It's a mix. Kind of they, they delayed the launch of the DFW flight. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, whatever there's, uh, they said they're trying to trim flights where they have multiple frequencies so that people can still get where they're going same day, but Got you. It's, it varies. Uh, and, and along those lines, United has delayed Bangalore. Again. Again. <laughs> you guys still have your tickets on the inaugural? No. Did they cancel them or did you finally give up? I, I never had one. I think Foz had a, a... I had one on the way back. I think I just dep- redeposited at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think they're now saying the latest is now October if it starts again, right? This is also like the bilateral rules for travel in and out of India is another crazy one that uh, theoretically has been, was being used to uh, either try to keep COVID out, which was clearly never going to happen, or to boost Air India and... Uh, well, that part sort of worked, but it'll be interesting <laughs> for, to see for when. now. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see when uh, uh, India resumes its sort of normal travel, international, long haul, whatever connectivity, because uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon. There's also separately just about India. Uh, some there's like a thing about from their uh, local news talking about how India needs to be needs more wide bodies in its fleets of, from its national carriers so that they could have a better part take you know. I'd play a bigger role in like transit traffic across the world, and I don't see how that happens. Did you tweet them the picture of the 787 being stripped down for parts? <laughs> um, it was. It's not just Air India, but yes, I mean, right? Like, well, part of it's that. Part of it is its largest airports, which theoretically would be used for transit, are at capacity, can't grow, and are at least in the case of Delhi, weather limited. Yeah. Um, so operationally, not great options. Um, I don't know. There's also another random company, Hans Air, that wants to fly A330s from between the UK and India again. <laughs> but the Indian airports are also not set up for transit, right? Generally, they are not. So that would be, they might want to start there before they chase wide bodies. Yeah. I mean, that, I, <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. I've done, I've done transit at Delhi and it's possible if you are, like it's sort of airline dependent because it yeah. depends on which terminal they use and how they're set up, but it's like, you can transit, but there's you know security and all that other extra stuff that's annoying. So that's that's right. I did have a bang uh, a Bangalore ticket. I had to return you guys, with you, Foss. Yeah, because Foss and I were trying to figure out how we were going to do it because they do allow transit at Bangalore. Right, but right. Foss can't enter the country. Exactly. So Foss was going to. I was just going to transit with Foss. I wasn't going to leave. So yeah, things that bring back memories. Um. And so we actually wait, wait, you have some kind of Delta schedule change here. Does that matter? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I wanted to talk about that because we got a note from a friend of the show, Stefan. Um, he sent me something and he said, you know, it's the Delta dartboard seems almost surgical now. Um, <laughs> because he's seeing domestic flights operate on different days of the week, depending on frequencies and stuff. So he's having to fly other carriers because Delta's schedule now out of Seattle is, uh, kind of requiring overnights in some cases to actually make it work. So like they're not flying daily on O'Hare or whatever? Yeah. That's listen. Day of week variability is very much a thing amongst the airlines now, even the bigger ones, because of what demand is. But it's shocking to me that O'Hare, Seattle for Delta doesn't justify daily service. Well, and I, I think this, I, I, you know, in this chat with him, I was kind of bringing up that I think I, I think Delta is kind of seeing the effects of not being one. They're not ha- getting the international traffic in Seattle that mm-hmm. they had planned on. Right. Fair. That's not happening right now. Um, but I also think they're partially losing the battle with Alaska um, on some of these like random routes that Alaska flies. I mean, going into a, a hub of United and American out of Seattle, which isn't strong for you yet anyway, seems like a bad idea. 
I mean, was the Delta Hub at Seattle ever going to work without the international feed? I, I think at this point it has to for them, right? I mean, well, maybe it doesn't have to. Maybe, and, and this is this this is the theory I'm positing. I think that they could make Seattle work if they fly some of the niche 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 routes out of Seattle. They fly Hawaii, right? There's always going to be traffic to Hawaii out of Seattle. They fly Cancun, they fly Cabo, um, and then they fly the international stuff, and they keep a, a kind of like a west of the Rockies connection hub for international stuff when it comes back. Um, and I think that's how they make it work. I don't think they can do tons of transcons and stuff that Alaska flies once or twice or three times a day. I don't think they can compete with that. Um, maybe JFK, but we've proven they couldn't even keep up that traffic. But is there money to be made if they don't do the international? If they don't do the international, I think, yeah, they have to close it as a hub. I think that's what props everything up. I think Hawaii, there's money in Hawaii flights out of, out of Seattle. And yeah, I think. But, oh, but that, that, I mean, even Northwest used to fly those, right? Yeah. So you don't need a hub for that. Yeah. I mean, right. it's, they've made a, they've, they've made a huge investment. Someone said that that's just, you know, the cost of doing business and they'll just drop it. I don't, that doesn't seem like Delta style to me to say this is a lost cause. Close it. Just ask DFW. Mem- Memphis, DFW, <laughs> Cincinnati. But, but, but don't you think that they've LA the first time? <laughs> those, it is different. It is different. There's no but, doubt, Stephen. The but climate is different. Yeah. I, I get but that was still fun for us. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> Pittsburgh, you know, where else can we go? Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I forgot. Pittsburgh had Delta too? Yeah. For a while. Yeah. I remember they them did? in the USA. Or- not like, not like a huge, but they were operating like to random cities in the West out of Pittsburgh and then the connections on to Europe. I thought that was Indianapolis. Was it Indy? Might Indy was the old Northwest that Delta inherited. Uh, that might have been what I was thinking then. I had to Paris flight. I don't know. I mean, talking about like what makes a hub work and whatever sort of veers into a conversation I was having someone online last week about as we were seeing some of these regional drawdown and Delta's included in that. Um, are there hubs that, you know, if 50 seaters don't really come back to the same level as they were two years ago, do some of the hubs that depended on the sort of the banks of 50 seaters coming in and out start to collapse because the economics no longer makes sense. What you're, you're saying that, that Denver is going to go away. I mean, well, Minneapolis, I, I, probably Minneapolis more than Denver, but Houston. I mean, we've yeah. already seen the drawdown in Houston somewhat. Yeah, I was, right? was going to say college station's gone. Yeah. And others. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and what I wonder if part of that though, becomes a question of how much, uh, O and D traffic or, you know, people going to the hub, because it's a major metro area, can offset some of those losses. But, I mean, you start looking at sort of the economics of how the hubs work, and some of those small markets that are only flown on a 50-seat regional jet were charging outrageous rates because that was the only way to get there. Yeah. And when that very, very high-yielding traffic vanishes, you know, the, the finances around what makes a hub tick and how do you, you know, they work on scale and they work on that breadth of coverage in many ways. And I don't know, it was, I I don't have the, the answer, I don't think, but talking through it a little bit online the other day was sort of started to wonder about what would some of these smaller hubs that don't necessarily have the bigger planes and don't necessarily see as significant steady traffic, uh, Mm -hmm. but do a lot of little planes. How would that play out? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, it's a good question. So, I mean, Stefan was asking that. I mean, he, I think he was kind of making the point that it seems like Delta's making some cuts. Uh, it doesn't surprise me a ton. I, th- I, I think to the operational, I don't know that Delta has the operational breadth that Alaska has out of Seattle, uh, meaning recovery. Sure. Um, and we even know that Alaska struggled during this last big snowstorm in the beginning of Omicron to get planes where they, they were flying a lot of empty planes to places to pick up crews and operate segments that had been missed. So I don't know that Delta was prepared for that, and I, we'd have to go in and like dig into the numbers and stuff. But maybe they're taking that into consideration, like, hey, we can't operate daily flights if this this is the norm now. So, um, tell me about Boom. This isn't really happening, is it? Well, sort of. Um, the uh, the their XB1 demonstrator, which is the tiny little single seat plane that they're trying to use to prove that they can fly supersonic, uh, is probably going to fly um and the the big news last week is that they they announced that they've started doing engine tests on the ground yeah so it's got three what j85s which is a ge engine that used to be used on the f5 um and it's a you know it's it's a relatively stock engine um they they got a few of them they put them in this thing and they're gonna they've started doing their ground tests out at centennial airport uh outside denver and so that's happening. They said they're going to be able to do 
ground tests up to full throttle on all three engines with the plane uh, tethered down, as well as up to like I want to fifty knots or sixty knots, so like seventy five mile an hour taxi tests. Okay. And once all that's done, they'll put it on a flatbed and drive it down to Mojave, and then from Mojave is where they'll actually do the full speed engine tests and taxi tests, and then eventually the test flights. You, you know, you know, there was a there was a plane that was a single seater that broke the sound barrier before, right? Yes, yes, I'm familiar with it. It was like six. The, the X one B. Is that what it was called? Yes. I didn't, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize they were that much of <laughs> that. They leaned that heavily on the history for the name of this thing. That's yes. sh- shame on me. <laughs> I, 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 it it kind of irritates me a little bit. Like it's kind of like spitting in the face of you know. Yeah, now I'm super annoyed at them too. I mean, <laughs> I've always been very annoyed at them and whatever, but uh, this especially. <laughs> I think you just triggered him, Stephen. <laughs> he's gonna go. Well, he's gonna go make some more uh, cutting boards after this show. So I out. definitely am. Um, <laughs> well, uh, listen, Boom is a lot of hype and a lot of talk, and they're gonna they're, listen when, when, if and when this the XB1 flies, they can prove, hey, look, we know how to do supersonic. That's got to be the thing that gets them their real funding, because yeah. right now they don't have enough money to make Overture, which is what their real commercial plane is. Also, though, like I don't want to say none, but very little of the technology and very little of what's going to happen in the XB1 comes across to uh, Overture. It's more it's of like a the... proof of concept to get the uh, the the money, right? Like. Just yeah. to, to get more funding. That's right, all but it's like, what concept are you proving? That a plane can fly supersonic? I think we've known that for a while now. Yeah, uh, I mean, we have quite a few planes that can do it. It's, so, it's kind of wild. Um, and, oh, you can do it with commercial engines. Uh-huh. But, you know, like, <laughs> also been done before. <laughs> and also, like, the engine that this thing, that the XB-1 is using, is not the engine that Overture is going to use. Yeah. Right? They, they, it can't. It's too small. Like, and it has afterburners, and they want to do it without afterburners. And, 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 and. There's all sorts of things about it that, like, just don't add up. And, I don't know. Uh, it's not the right engine. It's, like, it's not the same shape airplane, so they, they can't even claim it's just a scaled up version. Like, I think they're claiming that it's to, to test some of the, uh, materials and control surfaces, because it's composites instead of metals, but, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical in general. It just sucks. I'd love to go supersonic at some point because I think that'd be cool. But uh, yeah. and it's Concord and Concord and I think we're done. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Uh, um, let's talk about the Boeing Triple Seven X program. Their head, like the program head, is retiring. Yeah, in April. Uh, but he is, you know, in typical Boeing fashion, they've replaced him in terms of who's doing the actual work. Uh, the chief program engineer from the triple seven has moved over to triple seven X effective immediately while he transitions out. So, um, and the guy who's retiring, I don't remember his name, uh, he also was head of the max and the seven, four, eight programs. So okay. take that for what it's worth. Yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what does this mean for the triple seven X? I mean, it's, it seems like it's pretty much on schedule right what now. Schedule. Well, yeah, huh. but like, <laughs> I, I guess the revised, did kind I of, just say that out loud? I mean, you, you did. Yes. Uh, oops. I don't but know. It, uh, it, I mean, yes, they are doing their certification flights and whatever, but like at this point, one's got to wonder what the FAA is really willing to tolerate in terms of new aircraft certification. And, and you know, right, it's going to be sort of a, an amended type certificate because that's how it's always happened with these sort of iterative developments. But like things, I think, are going to be different for this than they were for the MAX when it finally got its certification. Even like the MAX 10, I think Boeing has acknowledged is going to have to be a somewhat different process than. The eight and the nine and even the seven. Yeah, true. So, and, you know, in it, I think there's good news, but uh, in some ways of you know helping ensure passenger safety. But get the part where we sort of have to get to the point of what does it take to certify airplanes again? Um, there's there's a lot of reasons why you know we haven't heard anything from Boeing about a middle of market plane, whatever, mm-hmm. and all that other stuff. And I think part of that is certificate, like trying to understand the new uh, aircraft certification environment in the united states and what would take to get there and is it you almost have to wonder if it's worth trying to build one at this point you know like yeah just with the certification delays and and just well, the, kind of the headache it's the headache right i mean the delays are what they are for the existing ones but if you think you know part of it is like how many hours of flying does it take and what does it t- you know to get to a certified product would it be more in a clean sheet design than it would for the triple seven x or a max mm. i think the answer is yes and so like how many more and what would it take to get there? And then, you know, that becomes part of the cost of a new program. And just the, the, I mean, years ago, we used to talk about 
how big the engines are now and how are we reaching engineering limits on them? And like, Foz yeah, we talked argue, about that on the show. Yeah. And Foz would argue, yes, given the number of engine uh, issues, challenges we've seen, I think. But like, uh, that has to carry over to, uh, overall engineering of airplanes today. And are we getting to some of the limits, at least of the designs that we're used to and the construction technology that we're used to? And then the next step, how much is it going to cost to get there? And right, like someone's saying, you know, middle market Boeing still has to do something to compete with Airbus. And my response was, how many could you possibly sell? And then, you know, how do you, how much money can you make on any of them? And if it's a true clean sheet new design, how do you justify the cost of that? Because my guess is that the market is somewhere between 500 and a thousand of them over a 20 year window. And if it's a $5 billion program, how do you make back $5 billion above actual costs? Or yet, right? I mean, the manufacturing yeah. costs, but you got to make back the, engineering and development and whatever and marketing and all that stuff investment on only 500 to a thousand frames well and not to mention that airbus has already sold right and so 500 to a thousand is pretty optimistic yeah exactly and so i I mean it's a good point right like it's something that people forget like like airbus has already sold some of these planes what we what we would consider middle market planes yes tons of them 321 xlr yeah and and so now boeing's looking at it like well okay it was a missed opportunity but we're not going to pursue it it's too little too late now that's that's a great point of the seven eight though to a point where it becomes price competitive it'll be cheaper than launching a new program like come up with like a a smaller seven eight yeah or i guess you're one of the books they're not even making smaller ones they're just selling them to american airlines cheap yeah the seven eight eight has almost the same capacity in a two cabin configure as a seven five two the yeah. problem, the problem with the seven eight eight is how heavy it is, and um, which means trip cost and you know fuel costs remain relatively high comparably. Uh, I thought there was some discussion. I think on the Airbus side about trying to reduce the weight. Um, I would love to see like if they if they could take out some of like the rear fuel tanks or some of the extra fuel tanks to save weight um, and come up with a much lighter seven eight eight. That would be a spectacular regional. Uh, wide body. Yeah. All right. The Make- three to four thousand mile trip. So you write your, your Japan stuff where they fly triple sevens domestically now. Stuff like, things like that. You could pack people in still. You do some pretty high volumes. You get the lighter plane. Um, but the, or the three thirties across China. I mean, how much is that worth developing given the 929, uh, from Comac? That's a, uh, Comac? Yeah. Uh, that's in progress. But just, you know, where do, you know, where is a market going to be for some of these sort of, small mid-sized twin aisles that don't necessarily need five to eight thousand mile trips but do need you know enough seats a, a, a seven eight three if you would very similar to that <laughs> <laughs> so this for those who don't remember the 787-3 was supposed to be part of the line and was specifically targeting japan and the domestic stuff there and regional like over to china and it was uh scrapped early on uh but it was it was also a shrink wasn't it yeah, it's a smaller, it's a smaller fuselage, like lengthwise. Yeah, and uh, so I think they had some different aerodynamics of the wings as well. And so Boeing decided to scrap that when some of the initial delays hit the program because they didn't want to develop a different, like all the other little bits. They wanted the commonality. But yeah. if you could just take the eight and somehow drop, you know, thirty thousand pounds out of it, uh, that'd be cool. Um, for our Patreon subscribers, we're going to talk a little bit about West Coast ground stops and some Emirates incidents in the bonus round if you are not a patreon subscriber you can subscribe and get that extra content if not that's fine we'd love to hear from you tweet us send us a, a comment uh yeah but thanks for listening and uh happy travels bye-bye take care catch you next time <laughs>